Is everyone willing to take notes? I, I don't mind. Ah. Just a minute, just a time uh, math is offered to help. Yeah, um, that we don't good. we don't necessarily need a play-by-play -play math. This thank you. Um, just you know, if we have decisions, major points to come up, that would be wonderful. Uh, thank you. All right, now that we've done that, uh, so Alan, are you gonna send them chocolate? No, virtual chocolate <laughs> only. Okay. Very well. So um, with that, uh, well, so the next slide was just about scribes. We already did that, so that's great. Uh, I think Alan's willing um, to at least Mark, help Martin, uh, uh, I think Mattis has a question on the note. Um, yes, Mattis. It's on the chat. He's asking where should he take the notes or something like that. Okay. Uh, there is uh, a link. I, on, I think I found it. It, it okay. opened in the in the Mika cool app instead of. Yeah, yeah. There's a note taking tool there. You can also access from the data tracker page. Ah, I found it. Wonderful. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to hand over the ball to you, Ian, and you can take it from here. Great. Um, thanks. Uh, well, welcome everyone. Um. Uh, I'm going to go over a little bit of background motivation because uh, some of you have not been. Um, Kind of chatting with with others about uh, TTL, um, and so the um, some critical points about uh, TTL and, and how we're discussing it here, and and kind of what we have for MOQ is objects are immutable, or at least in I mean, you know, asterisk, but like for the object content certainly is immutable, and the intent is for most of the properties to be immutable, um, and so as a result, some of the things. Uh, that a TTL might be used for, or a cache duration might be used for in HTTP, have like different meanings, um, or like there are different needs, right? Like a HTTP resource can change, an object is not supposed to, right? So like just keep that in the back of your mind when you're thinking about TTL, um, because that that does kind of change the game. The fact that it's immutable. Okay. Um, so there's one I'm going to, I am, I don't have slides. Actually, I was going to present the issue and briefly to go over my uh, window. I'm actually going to go to this window. Um, okay. So uh, I'm going to do, great. So there have been a few issues and discussions around TTL. Um, this is the most recent that kind of motivated this discussion. Um, one of the motivations is for cases like Meet or other kind of WebEx sort of use cases, um, you know, you really don't want the cache to like keep that content around very long because it's it's got a very short kind of value. Um, and so you don't want the cache being polluted by a bunch of Meet content that's basically useless after like 100 milliseconds or so. Um, so that's kind of one uh, type of use case. Another is, uh, Kind of lower latency live, where you know maybe you want it to make it easy to scrub back uh, a certain amount of time, but typically you expect users to only um, you know go back at you know thirty seconds, five minutes, whatever the application indicates. Um, and so that's again kind of that's more of a cache hint uh, to make sure that the cache doesn't get filled with with content. So those are some example use cases that I think are pretty clearly in scope uh, and are motivating kind of this feature. Um, and sorry, are the hands raised already, or are we good? We are good. Okay. Um, I'll monitor the queue for you, Ian. Thank you. I appreciate that because it, it's in another tab. Um, so the first PR that I put up um, just adds a cache duration to every object conceptually. Um, it's in the existing stream mapping thing. So you know, if you use uh, anything but object per stream, you end up only having to kind of put it once per stream, so it saves a few bytes. Um, zero indicates that the relay should just do whatever it wants to do, which is kind of another way of saying, you know, which makes sense for th things like VOD content and other things where uh, how often it's requested is probably a better indication of how, how long you should cache it than um, anything that the origin that's producing the content would provide. Um, so that's, that is one approach. Um, there are some pros and cons. Um, it's not really clear we need this on a per object basis is one thing, um, but it it does provide a mechanism that achieves at least the simplest versions of the goals of the two use cases that I that I want. Um, Victor put up two PRs. Victor, would you mind explaining kind of your thought process 
processes and motivation behind them and sure. walk us through them really quickly. Thank you. So is there, like, when I was trying to understand the use cases for this, there were two kinds of use cases, one of which revolved around making sure that we do not send data uh, uh, after it's, like, no longer useful in real-time case, and that's, like, very focused on deliver performance. And that's what the 449 PR to, about delivery timeouts is about. And there was a second case which focused more around the. Uh, oh, one moment. I'll pull that up. Policy. So this is the delivery timeout PR 449. It's a pretty straightforward yeah. mechanism, I think, to achieve kind of what uh, Victor just said, which is, you know, the user will not want this after this amount of time, like in the meet case. So please don't send it because it will degrade their application performance. Okay. Sorry. Uh, please continue, Victor. I'll yeah, the so second one is more about policy. It's like imagine I have a sports game and it's like three hours long. And in terms of my contract, I have that like I can provide DVR for the last 30 minutes and that I must not reserves the content after the broadcast ends. So there are like a combination of two mechanisms. First one is like relative that can let you tell on per subscription basis that like any content that you have paying for subscription uh, is allowed to be uh, uh, basically any content you are only allowed to reserve that for like that many seconds. Yep. And the second one is just like an absolute end time, which lets you to enforce the second kind of constraints. Like, I know where my broadcast ends, and I want you to hard expire everything that happens after that time. Uh, so those are less about transport performance and more about enforcing policy. And uh, the and both of them are on the subscribe OK. Yeah, like, so the idea here. here is that you can set it Per, essentially per entire track. Uh, and so for, yeah, uh, there are cases in which I could imagine that being useful for objects, but those cases are very specific and there is a lot of overhead. Great. We have um, some in the queue. Oh, uh, can I uh, elaborate a little bit more on delivery timeout? Say. Yeah, please uh, continue. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, delivery timeout. So, one of my concerns is that uh, uh, I essentially want to make sure that we uh, are consistent in how we treat our objects in terms of deliver preferences. So, for instance, if we say that we're doing stream pin crew, uh, uh, the idea I would have is. Uh, like the idea that I have is like you will actually deliver objects in order and the transport will not do anything to undo that because uh, essentially when you're using stream for groups, you're saying that your objects are not useful unless they're in that order. Uh, so the PR is very carefully worded around making sure that that stays true. So we have, we have a queue building. Um, okay. I will, I will add one, one comment from a, I think is a factual statement. I think this, these two PRs also achieve or could be used for the use cases that I initially described around, you know, low latency live, um, you know, Zoom, meet calls, things like that. Um, at least that's my view of it. It seems like they would, they're both like fit for purpose, at least conceptually. So, um, but yeah, these are both on the subscribe. Uh, and the other one was on objects. Um, uh, and with that, I will let people give their comments. Uh, I'll let you, Martin, why don't you just run the queue? Because that yeah, way I don't have to go back and forth between tabs. Yeah, this is more of a clarification question for me to understand. If I read all the three PRs put together, um, the object duration, uh, delivery timeout, and the relative, uh, they all seem to be trying to solve a similar problem, but um, depending upon like who owns the decision making is the one that that's changing like and also how much of uh, the restriction is put on the stream mapping um so like put to both ian and victor is my understanding correct that the delivery timeout um object cache duration and relative are very similar 
Um, yeah. My impression is that the as a cash duration and delivery timeout are really similar. Yes. I, I think the biggest difference is one, we wouldn't, I assume we would not land all three. Um, and and the, the kind of one is on the first one, the per object, you'd either do per object or per subscription. Um, actually, as an individual, I kind of actually think I like per subscription better, but that's, I mean, I wrote up the per object one because that seemed like kind of where the interest was at the time. I don't have a particularly strong preference as long as they're all workable, so. And uh, I'll come back, but another clarification question for me is that like when we say per subscription, that does, does that mean that across subscri subscriptions, those values can change? I, I mean, I, based on how it's written, I assume that one could have um, a different, you know, absolute or relative expiry for one subscribe versus yeah. another. Uh, uh, my clarification here is that I can imagine that, like, if you're doing requests in the past, you might have different delivery timeout or not, no timeout. Whereas if you're subscribed in real time, you might have different. Uh, yeah. Okay, thanks. I'll come back. Luke. Cool. I'll, I'll start with a clarification question and then opinions next hand raise. Um, what's the difference between your um, delivery timeout and the relative content availability? Like they seem like they're identical, but in two different PRs. Or is there a subtle difference between them? Well, as I said, they're different in intent. And uh, as a reason uh, I did not is that try to not overlap them as one of them is on the scale of many, many minutes, and other is on the scale of uh, seconds at most. Well, it could uh, be, right. Um, OK. Uh, yeah. OK, that was just the, uh, that was clarification. I'll let other people go first. Um, although I did want to say one thing. Um, I know this isn't subscribe OK, but I think conceptually it helps me think of this thing in track info. And it probably should be there too, because uh, it's the property of the track, really. Uh, we just also put track info and subscribe OK, so you don't need to get that information separately. Like the latest group, we don't, you know, we just put that data there. But I would consider this a track property, not a subscribe property. OK, Will's in the wrong queue, but he is next. <laughs> I'm in the wrong queue because I'm on a mobile phone, and there's just no way I can get back to the media echo and actually get back here. So I apologize for that. I will be in the wrong queue for the rest of the hour. Um, OK, no worries. <laughs> I I agree that these are track properties, not so much uh, subscription. It's efficient to put them in the in the body. A, a, in for Victor's uh, PR, and I made a comment on this. A a relative timeout makes sense to put as a track property, right? But the absolute one to me doesn't make sense unless every object in your track expires at the same time, but the track has a linear duration. So you get a very weird behavior where your first object lasts a long time and the last one lasts fractions of a second. So I think absolute timeouts should be decoupled from the relative cache hints and that those, those are going to differ for every object that is sent. So that it's inevitable that they should be object properties and we can encode them efficiently. We have mechanisms for putting them in the, in the stream header if, if they're consistent for all the objects in the stream but i think the relative one should be the track property and then the object one should carry the absolute not don't deliver past this war clock time threshold victor yeah yeah i can see absolute one being not as useful as relative one at least on per track level yeah, my use case was a 24 by 7 stream, a linear stream that's just running. Uh, All okay, yeah, can run it for months. Uh, I agree, that's not useful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Three. Have we drained the queue, Martin? Sorry. The uh, queue is clean. Okay. Um, All right. Um, let me ask a question. Um, do we want to talk more about the difference between the delivery timeout and the cache duration just conceptually and like, um, or sorry, delivery timeout and what the other one, I should just like open another tab. Um, 
Uh, Victor, uh, Luke, Luke, I guess, now has an opinion to share. Okay. I mean, I, I have opinions. I'm just trying to be polite um, and not over speak. Um, so I think just to, to say what Will said, the absolute ending is just bizarre because you'd have to know when a live stream would end, which is like one thing you just don't know about live streams. Um, and if you knew when it would end, you could just set a relative time and end anyway. Um, so I don't I don't see a use case for the absolute cache duration for the entire track, at least. Maybe for a group or something, but not for the track. Um, and uh, I was just going to say, uh, my little variant on this PR is it'd be really nice if the subscriber could specify when it wants, you know, when it's no longer interested. Like, you're basically your maximum jitter buffer size to say, like, after 100 milliseconds, don't try and send me a group or an object because I am real time only. You might as well just reset the stream. After 10 seconds, like if I'm a higher, like reliable live, you know, please just stop sending it. Uh, so you have like the subscriber preference for this cache duration, effectively the the uh, the transmission timeout. Uh, but you also have the publisher side, which is this maximum cache. So I think you both want the publisher and the subscriber to kind of negotiate how long until something should be dropped. Uh, so it kind of it would be a per subscription property there in that, in that instance. Uh, I'm going to call an audible here. Um, turns out that Meet has ordered hand raising. So uh, in light of Will's participation, I think we're just going to switch the queuing to to raising your hand here in Meet rather than Meet Echo. Um, I'll try to be grac gracious to people who get that backwards still. So feel free to just raise your hand in Meet from now on. Will, you're next. Thank you. I just wanted to apply to, to Luke's question of what's the utility of an absolute timeout and why can't it just be relative? <clears throat> the answer is because obviously relative is dependent on when you got the object. So say you're an edge cache and you go forward to a parent, that parent might have got that relative timeout an hour ago and it made sense an hour ago, but now it's an hour later, right? So in fact, the absolute time is marching on, but that relative window, you can't keep reissuing it. So we can't like, cache that we can't there can't be a property of an object so i think if there's an absolute non availability availability such as a sporting event that your rights end at a certain 3 p.m eastern then i see no way around putting an absolute time and also making it something that varies with the groups in other words it can't be a, a fixed track track property uh victor uh are you sure uh i think i'm supposed to be later but anyway uh, uh my clarification as to there was a question earlier as to why would you want to uh have different relative timeouts and that's like one thing i have in mind is that if you send subscribe for real time it's 30 minutes but if you're trying to fetch a DVR entity for like 25 minutes and pass, you will only can it's only set like it to five minutes to respect that policy thing. Luke. Yeah, well, um, I think the main issue here is that the cache TTL is based on receipt, like the receipt time of a group or object. And especially when things are out of order or like there's late subscribers. That's what's complicating a lot of this protocol. Um, I think we still just deal relative uh, durations, but the alternative is to go deeper down Pandora's box and do timestamps. Like either what what being, is being proposed here is wall clock timestamps, which are fine. <laughs> but um, if you really want things to be properly expired at the right time, which really is not that important of a property, honestly, because we have prioritization. Like prioritization will keep the user experience good. This is just for caching. This is just for like efficiency. Um, we'd have to start putting timestamps in there, like the media timestamp, and you expire based on the media timestamp. Yeah, but Luke, can I just discuss because it's much easier that if we go direct. I think the cache hints should be relative by by all means. They're they're just a cache hint and they're relative. It's only the what what look what Victor said was the 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 availability, which is not a uh, it's not a performance. It's not a live edge delivery feature. It's a legal requirement. I, I don't want any consumers to get this content after this war clock time. And we want to avoid every serve, every relay having to go all the way back to the origin to ask, can I serve this now? Can I serve this now? By embedding 
an absolute timestamp in the object. So when it's cached, before the server serves it, it can check, is war clock time past this point? If it is, I'm, I'm not going to serve it. I have a clarification question, Will, if you might. Um, are you, you think that should be a per object property, not a per track property? So. Well, if it's, a, I, I don't see the use case where it's the same for every object in the track. Um, I, my track starts, and if I say I want this, the each object to expire one after if one hour after it was first broadcast, right? The first object has a certain expiration time. The object is is four seconds. The next object is whatever seconds behind that, and and so it goes. Every object has a different expiration time. So we want to decouple that from when a particular node or relay received the object, because depending how far it gets through your cache hierarchy, you can you can inherit these stale uh, expiration times, times that made sense when the object was first requested, but they don't make sense later on when that object is then served from, from cache. So I think it's okay to put it in the object. We can, we can still do it relatively efficiently, and maybe we come up with a more compact scheme if we're worried about the, um, the size of the timestamp. And plus, it's only under use cases where we care about availability. We, it, it, we may, most streams may never use that, right? So they'll just co we code a zero point a bit in there and, and you move on. Um, but there sure. are certainly streams that will need it. Yeah, the, I mean, the policy question is an interesting one. I'm just trying to think through. Yeah. I usually look at an entire piece of content expiring, but um, OK. We'll yeah, on one answer. very quick uh, question uh, for the for the availability limit. What's the difference between the availability limit and the expires field in the subscriber? OK, it looks, it seems to me they can do the same thing. Yeah, it expires. You're talking about like this delivery timeout and yeah, this is yeah, this uh, is the previous question. This one. Uh, 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 oh, uh, there, there's, there's an expires field in subscribe. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. There is an expire field. That's the second one. Yeah. Oh. It expires is uh, not related to caching or delivery. It expires just this. The idea is that. Uh, uh, after some time, your subscription will go away, and you would have to resubscribe. Can we use the expire to enforce the content policy? I think they were intended to be different mechanisms. OK, then what happens uh, after this expiration or, or the availability limit? So, the behavior is different? Um, I don't think the expired behavior is as well described as I might hope. And so I would like, I mean, not to um, be overly narrow, but I'd like to kind of keep it out of this conversation because I, I think it's it's kind of trying to solve a different problem. And um, but, but, it, uh, but yeah, are you talking about the delivery timeout and the absolute limit relative, or are you talking about Oh, limit uh, versus the uh, OK, that's a Victor question, I think. The answer here is that once the limit is passed, you cannot cache it. You would have to refetch it from the origin. Mike. But if it's a legal requirement, so we, the, the publisher will not uh, uh, want or relate to request an uh, expired or not available content, right? Yes, that's basically like the publisher was after then immediately like reject the re new request and the end user would get the new thing, which is basically you're not allowed to do that, sorry. Okay, Mike. All right. Um, so in the past, I've been uh, the vocally adamantly against introducing timestamps if we can avoid it at all. Um, 
and I still want to exercise uh, a fair bit of caution there. I, I think we should avoid uh, using timestamps for anything related to, you know, buffer filling or delivery properties. Um, but I do think that they're like the use case of needing to not deliver after a certain time for contractual reasons is a valid one. Um, I'm going to have to think a little bit more about uh, which of these mechanisms best serves that. Um, but there there may be a, a limited case for a timestamp somewhere in here. I just really want to avoid um, using it for for delivery because um, I think that's that's fraught with race conditions and, and clock sync issues and a bunch of other things that we would do best to avoid. Mo? I just wanted to reiterate that in a prior meeting, um, we floated the idea of these uh, uh, trick player licensing scenarios. Maybe you can use uh, something else other than the direct parameters inside of the object transport, like manifests or even authorization tokens with uh, with timestamps. I personally think that's a better solution than trying to embed this kind of stuff into the protocol, and especially if it inflates object sizes. But you can only do that if you trust the client. Like you say in the manifest, don't request it after this date. But there's malicious clients who will go ahead and request it after that date. So we actually need a mechanism as part of the delivery system that refuses to distribute it after some threshold. And I think it's difficult if I don't see a way we can put that in the manifest and then trust the clients to, to honor it. But it seems like an authorization issue. Right? You're telling the clients that they're not authorized to have this content beyond this time. It doesn't seem like a delivery optimization or, or network distribution problem. It's you're telling the client it cannot, it cannot receive. It's not authorized to receive this this content anymore. Right, but you have no way to enforce that authorization other than you could argue the client must have an access token and that token must have a time limit, uh, and that's that's valid, right? That would work. But now we're we're saying that the way for for mock to distribute the secure content is you must use tokens with it if you want to enforce a time limit and we should we should only make that statement carefully because i think that's quite limiting versus having some network ability to do it sorry i spoke without putting my hand up. that's right a uh, quick question for ian did you want to get to the other prs today or is this just a forum for all of these issues what you have here um i mean I'm <clears throat> considering these three prs kind of a cluster and i my goal is to get to a clear answer as to like what what set or subset of them or new PR should be landed based on this conversation. Okay, so, that's, you, that's so, so you're happy for this current discussion. If we, oh, if we can drive this to like done done, then that would be perfect. Okay, excellent. Luke, um, I, at some point, I have accumulated some questions for the group. I don't know if we'd want to do an official poll or not, but um, I definitely want to drain the queue first. Um, okay. Okay, Luke. Yeah, I agree with Mo. This could be like a DRM thing, you know, like the key server just doesn't give you a key after a certain amount of time. Uh, they're going to use DRM anyway for the football. But um, regardless, I do think it's a valid use case that actually this setting a track timeout doesn't really work for DVR or VOD use cases. Because if you fetch the content faster than real time, like it already exists, you're just going to have a bigger cache than you intended if it was live, if that makes sense. Like if you're downloading it at twice the speed because it's old content, you're, you're, the amount of cash that the, you're going to use is going to be twice as much. Um, so I'm kind of actually flip-flopping a little bit. I think putting this on a, a per stream timeout makes more sense. Um, uh, instead of doing a track-wide property, just that way you can actually subtract the time remaining. So if you serve a group, I mean, I know it goes orthogonal to like groups are not, you know, are immutable. But really, you need to know how long an object's been in the cache and subtract that when you're serving it to make sure that, or do a wall clock timestamp. I just, I agree with Mike. I don't want wall clock timestamps. <laughs> so I think the only option is to subtract. Alan? Yeah, I mean, one of, one of these is a, a chair comment, which is just that it seems like the absolute timestamp that's been introduced here that we're talking about is a little bit, um, or, since I think people agree it's orthogonal and like a, a little bit sort of a new use case but maybe we can hold that one aside and focus just on um the piece that's about like caching and um maybe we can make more progress in the time we have left and then 
Um, that was sort of a chair comment. And the more of an individual comment has to do with the, the comment just made that Luke just made, which is that if you look at how, I think if I, I'm not, even though no HTTP, I'm not HTTP caching guru, but my understanding is that things work on age, which involves how long things have been in cache and you, like the headers set, like the maximum age after which something can be served and whatnot. So um, I just think there's a lot of experience in HTTP caching. And it, as we said at the beginning, it doesn't all make sense here because the same URL will always be the same content in mock, which is not true in HTTP, but that we, there may be things that we can learn and that we should use to inform, like rather than reinvent everything, especially since these things, systems are likely to be deployed alongside HTTP caches. All right, the queue is drained. Oh, no, there it is, Suhas. So there is the issue with uh, Google Meet. If you raise your hands and do not respond, it will lower your hand by itself. This happened twice. Without me touching the computer, just letting the chairs know this is happening. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, I I I agree with both Luke and Mo in the sense that um, per track, uh, this this should not be dealt apart per, per, per track level, uh, un unless you know, the publisher wants every object in every group to expire exactly about the same amount of time. Is is publisher's choice? He will put that value or uh, when when application choice to to, to do that. As a transport, we should not be enforcing one way one way or the other, and and uh, I I'm trying to push back on some of the use cases where uh, we are ha having a, one subscriber which can do real time, another subscriber doing DVR in the same application. I'm not sure like um, what is the use case and how how do we uh, want to solve because the delivery mechanisms and the requirements everything changes quite a bit in those two use cases, um, and I'm not sure like, how how can mock solve everything in in that, that use case having conflicting requirements. Um, having said that, uh, for all the PRs that are lo looking through, the object cache duration is closest to, I, I, because I, as a publisher, as an application, I I, I want uh, an application provider. I, I basically know how my objects should, how long my objects should stay in a relay network before it gets, uh, it, it's, it's of either value or, you know, uh, it, it it's needs to get delivered. And, and publisher marking that uh, as, we're kind of letting the release know or the next hop know what's the expected behavior kind of more fits in um, in the relative uh, use case that we're talking about. And I kind of want to think uh, on those lines. Well, yeah, I just want to answer Suas's question of what's the use case where you have a live edge and DVR playback in the same application. I think it's it's all the live sporting events. I, you watch a soccer game. Most people are watching the live edge. They want the lowest latency. Others join 30 minutes late because they got home late from work and they're just watching 30 minutes behind live. As a relay, I don't want two but two bit streams that I have to catch, one for the live edge and, and one for people behind live. It's going to be the same, same bits. I'm just holding them in cache longer and I'm willing to serve them for some period of time. So I think there's, there's just, a... just just class clarification question on that one. Uh, so in, in that case, like if, if the, the, the broadcaster sets uh, the, the cache duration or whatever we call that has like 30 minutes, wouldn't it work for both kind of subscribers? If they set a cache duration for 30 minutes, no, because somebody who pulls an object behind, say the broadcast is allowed to serve the live edge and one hour behind it but it's a four hour event. So the window that they're allowed to serve is const constantly changing. So if you tell somebody they have an hour to, an hour to cache something because you have an hour, one long cache window, that's, that, that's true as long as it's, it, that cache is refreshed now, right? But if, if, if two hours ago, some parent relay pulled that and you come get it now, it's not true that you have two hours available for cache. You have, now time minus two hours, right? You have the delta. It's easier if we draw this up on a screen, but I I worry about the 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 in inherited relative um, cache duration. You'd have to constantly adjust it relative to to what is now. If if you do it relative, Luke. Um, and well, I think that's fine because that's like max age in HTTP. Right, like you, the first request sets max age, and then subsequent requests you subtract the amount of time it's been in cache for, and giving it to to downstreams. Yeah. So um, what I meant, it, it it'll work yeah. as long as we do the subtraction and we enforce the yeah. subtraction in in the spec. I agree with you. Yeah, yeah. But uh, just to go back to Suez, um, 
it's a hard requirement for me that the objects that we use for real time need to be served for VOD and DVR. Like I, the whole point of this is we don't want a separate protocol to do real time and then another one to serve VOD, another one like we need to have a way that you can make an object, you can specify the maximum cache age. And I think what you said is right. Like you should specify the maximum yeah. cache age. The producer should say, please don't cache this any longer than two hours. I do think there should be a mechanism for the subscriber to say, oh, by the way, I'm real time. I only want like 100 milliseconds. Don't even bother opening a quick stream if it's older than that. But that's an optimization. Like it's not necessary per se. We mostly care about the publisher's max age here. Exactly. Yeah. Victor. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I'm a bit uh, uneven on like use cases where you basically have to. So the use cases that I'm not certain about is like when you're subscribed live to the same stream, but you have different jitter buffer sizes. Is that like in theory that sounds like a good optimization, uh, but in practice, like people kind of hate it, especially in something like sports games when like your sports game they sync and there are like five people watching the same game and you can hear like people in the next room cheering while your stream is two seconds behind. So in a lot of like cases, this is a bit this is both a feature, but it's also a downside. Uh, I think that like I like the kind of idea of maximum where a publisher can like of thinking of this as a maximum where as a publisher can say here is my maximum for this object or group and then the sender could lower it if they want to. Uh, that would make sense. Uh, but also uh, it, I don't think necessarily that we should fully like tie cache timeout to uh, delivery timeout. So if I'm watching a live stream, uh, it's entirely plausible for me that I would want to like per like give up after 30 seconds for like a really large buffer live stream. And that would make sense. But I would also, there isn't particular reason for me to also evict it from cache because it's entirely plausible that someone would like join it for DVR and then we could reuse that cache. So this is one of the reasons why I tried to split availability and delivery timeout is that so that things can go to cache even though you would give up delivering to those subscribers who are onto it for like real time use case. Just a real quick scribe interrupt. Victor, you just said uh, before that last bit that the publisher states that there's a maximum, and then you said the sender could lower it. Did you mean the subscriber could lower it? Uh, from yeah, the sorry, the subscriber could lower it. Yes, that's what okay, we're thank you. I... Mike, sorry, can you can you correct that in the notes? Maybe I'm not sure I got that right. I just did. Thanks. Um, Mike, I, yeah. I wanted to come back around to this idea of uh, the similarities and differences, like what we can learn from HTTP. And I think that uh, in that case, the uh, mutability of objects makes it very different, right? So a lot of what the caching related headers are doing are trying to protect applications from an inconsistent view of the world in the face of mutability, potential mutability. And, and then trying to maximize uh, cache efficiency in the face of that. So like, uh, I think here we're doing something different and it's mostly an optimization um, unless I misunderstand what some of the obligations are implied here. Um, but I guess I wanna raise the question, um, is there an obligation to hold things in cache up to a certain point? Uh, or is this just the publisher hinting that uh, expect subscribers to come looking for this up until this time? And I think I think it's the latter. Um, and I think we should be explicit about defining it as such. The um, the the initial per object one does I believe say like basically if you are caching, you should cache it for this long. But I mean, we could be even more vague if we want to be, yes, I, I, I agree. 
Um, I, I just want to kind of reiterate some of what Luke um, and, and, and others have said, uh, which which I, I tend to agree is um, the broadcaster is the one going going back to first first principles. The, the broadcaster is the one who basically has an idea of what kind of uh, um, range of subscribers he he or she wants to kind of uh, have his stream received, uh, and. and that something it, it def definitely based on that it sets the max age. It would not set the min age. It basically sets the max age so that you know, it can serve a real time one, a live stream one, or or, or the uh, DVR DVR one. If if th that's what we want, it will be setting for four hours or ten hours for that matter, right? If if they can pay for the cash to be kept in the network, and 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 I I also agree. Um, the delivery timeout can be turned around into what Luke was saying is a subscriber side optimization. If if subscriber can hint or really saying that you know I. I, I don't know how, how long you cash or anything, but uh, beyond this point, don't deliver this group for me because I already, for whatever reason, I, I'm i not inter interested in it anymore. Uh, I think that's like the cash duration kind of hits the first one, which is more talking about as a publisher or a broadcaster, I know how long my object should be valid. Uh, and it knows from the application and, and kind of subscribers it has. On delivery time, kind of I feel it falls into other side where can we, each subscriber can can it influence how long uh, an object needs to be delivered uh, based on what is basically this current pipeline of media pipeline is dealing with. I think separating those two things, which which should be a publisher control, I think that can be its own PR and which can be can subscriber influence a decision making on that can be a separate PR separate um, issue that we need to deal with. And the third one is that the content policy. They're like now there are the three different uh, prongs of this work. Is what I kind of feel. Mike. Yeah, I, did, I wanted to follow up on, on one thing I caught that Suha said that is, uh, will maybe raise some more like clarifying questions based on uh, what I was saying just a second ago. Um, I think I heard Suha say, if, if they can pay for it to stay in the network, um, and to me, that sounds like a very different behavior than you know opportunistically caching things. That sounds like you you do want some kind of guarantee. You don't want uh, you know your relays to come back to origin. You're trying to limit you know that you know bandwidth cost or or whatever. Um, and that sounds like a different set of behaviors that we expect than maybe if it's just kind of like okay, if I have the cache space, I'll keep it around. Um, but again, with immutability, it's kind of like, okay, if I have the cache space, I know this is immutable, I can always go back to origin. So mm -hmm. I think that what you're saying there actually raises kind of the key question here, the difference between potentially immutable content and what should be immutable content is that you could keep it in cache, you know, for no time at all, because you can always go back to origin. Mm -hmm. um, and so if we're expecting, you know, the publisher to not have it anymore, you know, that's something different that we want to communicate. Or if we're expecting, you know, that we don't want to have to have it anymore at the publisher side, or we don't want, you know, relays coming back, those are kind of different properties than just, uh, you can keep this in cash optionally. Um, so yeah, I think that's worth digging into. Ian, before we keep launching in here, is this converging for you in a useful way, or are there questions you want to ask in a poll or something at the end of the meeting? Um, no, it's it's actually I think it's converging in a way that is is useful at least in my mind. Why don't um, Luke? Do you want to go and then I'll kind of ask? Yeah, sure. I would suggest where we're going. Okay. I was just going to say we copy HTTP and do max age, basically. What everybody's talking about. This is just the maximum time you could cache. There's no guarantee you're going to cache this long. You might go back to origin for it. I don't want to pull in the whole cache control header, please. <laughs> please, no. But like max age is simple. Um, I still don't know if it should be on a per track or group basis I'm, or, or per stream basis. I'm leaning towards stream, even though it's a hint. So it's kind of verbose for a hint. But like, yeah, that would be my, my thing. Just copy their semantics. OK, Victor, why don't you, why don't you go just to? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I is I definitely not sure that we can we want like the hard requirement to guarantee that something stays in cash. Uh, uh, but yeah. 
Um, okay. Um, okay. So just the easy part, it seems like we're all settling on, we want a thing that is max age. Um, I think, unless I'm misreading the room, uh, or max age equivalent, and has similar properties, the potential question is where to put it, I believe. Um, a, it is reasonably natural to put it in the stream header, kind of like the um, first PR I wrote up does. That's this one. Um, I'm not saying it's the right thing, but it's a reasonable option if we want some amount of granularity. Um, obviously, we can also force it on every single object individually. It's a bit verbose. Um, or we could make it a subscription property, potentially. Um, thoughts? Go for it, Luke. Or Will, sorry. Yeah, well, the real question is, do we have a use case where it changes within the track? And my gut feel is I, I don't I can't see one where once you've started publishing a track, you want different objects or different groups within that track to be cached for a different amount of time. If 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 we have a use case where we can vary it within the track, then we obviously can't make it part of the subscription. And then we have to put it in group or, or stream headers and, and make it as efficient as, as we can there. Um, I don't have one, but I would love to hear what people think, Victor. Yeah, I, I feel vaguely in favor of trying to keep things that are same per track until we have like because putting everything like per stream or per object kind of uh, is a, a bit of overhead. So uh, I don't know. See, so, okay, I'll but see what else. I, I, I think I raised this concern uh, um, earlier. Like, I think it's it cannot it it per track is too restrictive. Um, we we are thinking of few use cases that we have in mind today, which, which for 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 some of those use cases it, it makes sense. Um, for for uh, even 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 in video use cases, uh, we, we are experimenting uh, in the case where uh, within a group, uh, every object depending on how far it's been from the iframe it expires differently because it's not needed beyond, beyond that point uh, uh, the iframe might be needed for the entire duration of the group but uh, the last object might not might not need so much of time uh, and and these objects are produced every 20 milliseconds um, and you don't want to keep uh, if the groups like 30 30 seconds you don't want to give keep this audio objects or whatever we say for such long i think as, as like we are uh Having a flexibility like what I think something to close what we have an object the, the cache duration will will give us sufficient um, leverage for different applications to uh, kind of explore that without compromising on the use cases that uh, where everything needs to be same as well it does not uh, 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 from from performance optimization it it, it does not hurt um, because if you're using a stream per track and every track to have or, or not for for example if you're using every object to have the exact same duration. There's not not much of uh, additional bandwidth that's going in with with the uh, current proposal that Ian has. I'm going to close the queue. Luke, please be brief. Yeah, I'm going to say I think it comes down to if you uh, need to be able to subtract the age, like for VOD, if if it matters when you requested the content that it expires. Uh, if it doesn't, then that's a track header. But if it matters that you requested it three hours after it was generated, now it has a different value, then it needs to go in the stream. Mike, please be brief. Yep. Uh, answering the question about uh, variation within a track, I could see wanting to keep uh, iframes longer than P frames, for example, um, which would be variation within a group even. Um, but again, is that an implementation detail or something that we need in the protocol. Um, and yeah, I, I think a lot of these things are implementation details, optimizations. Victor, very briefly, please. Yeah, I, I'm not sure how that those use cases would even work. My gut reaction is that I want you to explain more of this so I could figure out how to fit them into the scheme or like what exactly is happening because uh but uh, like what stream mapping would you use and how that would look as a result so i i i'm not saying that i 
I, I'm not saying that I'm not open to this, but like I, I want to understand them so I, I can address them better. Uh, Ian, I'm going to give you a last word before we uh, before the chairs take over again. Okay. Um, one, sorry, a few concluding thoughts. Um, one was uh, on the you know iframe, pframe, etc. thing. Um, I think it's very possible that will end up being cleanly dealt with with a priority mechanism. Um, once we sort that out, I realize that's a future thing. Um, but I actually think that that's probably a preferable way to do it than trying to use TTL on some like really, or max age on some really fine basis. Um, the other thing I want to observe is that if we put it in the object in any way, shape, or form, um, subtraction becomes weird. Um, and I'm going to throw out why I think it's weird. So that means I have to modify every single object as a relay as I'm fanning it out, right? So if I'm doing the max age thing where I like, I subtract out how long it's been in the cache, if I have one person who subscribed to head and one person who's like 30 seconds behind, either due to buffering or whatever, like I have to send them different objects, which I think we previously said we're kind of grumpy about. Um, and so I just want to throw out that like we do like, the math is easy, right? It's not difficult math, but like, it's it's adding a a bit of a bit of work on the delivery side that definitely complicates the situation, versus just you know this subscription arrived an hour after the original one, so I'm going to you know subtract an hour from the the max age or something. That's certainly a much more straightforward operation. Um, would be my observation. Um, and then the other thing is, I do think the Subscriber, uh, what, the idea of the subscriber dictating a delivery timeout, I think actually might be worth pursuing. Um, I don't know, Victor, if you're willing to rewrite this up to swap it around, um, but I, I think I would be interested in seeing um, kind of this PR just inverted. And I think uh, there's a lot of good use cases for it, and I think it actually might separate out a lot of use cases that we all have in the back of our mind and make it much easier to think about the max age concept. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Ian. I, I think we've reached convergence on a few issues, which is the point. That's good. Uh, I'd like to first of all thank our scribes, Mathis and Alan. Um, we're going to do a bunch of these. So uh, you know, it's probably not sustainable for one of our chairs to, to scribe every week. So uh, I invite you to please find an opportunity for, for you to, to help the community and keep records of what's happening here. Um, so we're going to do these. Uh, so this is a, this is an experiment. We've changed our editor's meeting to be this. Um, we're going to do these through at least Wednesday, June 12th. Uh, I invite you to send feedback to MOQ chairs about how you think this went. If uh, those of you who were in the editor's meeting before, if this was better or worse, and those of you who were not in the editor's meeting, whether you thought this went well or if anything went poorly, um, we will get, so the agenda for each of these meetings is MOQT issues, <laughs> pretty vaguely, because they're going to go as they go. Uh, we will endeavor to have uh, more specific issues out no later than the Monday before, two days before, but uh, ideally, um, you know, the, the Thursday or the Friday. Um, uh, right, so any feedback on me, please send it to MOQT chairs. Suhas, you had a question? I uh, Just a clarification question. So, I, um, sure. well, the uh, next step would be like, Ian, would be would you be working on the cache duration, clean, clean, cleaning up that one, or, and, and Victor will be working on flipping it around? Is is that the next, next steps for us to look forward that, to? That was, my intent was, yeah, that I was hoping that Victor would flip around the delivery timeout concept that and make oh. it subscriber driven, and Thanks. I would, uh, yeah, create a, a castration. I mean, I might even call it max age if people want me to, if you want to evoke the HTTP concept. Um, it seems like that's where we're headed, but um, yeah. I, I strongly vote against using the same name as HTTP because there's all sorts of behavioral inference that comes with that, okay. and that's not good for us. So in concept, yes, but in name, we should call it something new. Okay, I'm, I'm all, I can keep it as castration then, I think. I'm fine with that. I don't, I mean, people can also call it something but else. Made maximum cache duration. I think that was a nuance that came out today. You can cache it uh, for less, but it's not useful to cache it for longer. Okay. Thanks. All right. After the interruption of actual technical content, uh, back to my administrivia. Um, uh, the last thing is uh, we, uh, uh, I'm going to just go ahead and put out a call for who's planning to attend the Seattle interim in person. Please send email to MLQ chairs 
if you're doing that, I'm also going to obviously put that on the list. But um, while I have you here, please send us an email if you're coming. And that way I can get the head count right and get everyone lunch. Um, and that is it. Alan, do you have anything? Uh, no, I don't. I am sort of curious if Mathis and I were typing in two different places or if we were on the same okay. talk. Uh, maybe you guys could, could, later. <laughs> could figure that out later, uh, the hiccups. Um, all right. Well, we actually finished on time. So that's uh, A plus to us, I guess. Uh, and uh, I will see you all next week. Thank you.